uh, teething problems to start the webinar. So uh, this is part of one of the Coalition for Community Energy's webinar series. Uh, we held a webinar series last year uh, that was went down very well and they've repeated the exercise. This is um, the, what is it, the eighth webinar. Um, last week was on Warburton Community Hydro and there's a number of other ideas in the pipeline. Um, we've been watching along with interest. Uh, there's so much amazing work being done in the community energy sector and we're very proud to be uh, one of the founders of the Coalition for Community Energy and I'm really pleased to be uh, involved um, in this webinar series. So uh, today's uh, series uh, webinar, we're going to be talking about solar gardens. So about a year ago, uh, the Institute for Sustainable Futures, the Community Power Agency, and at least 17 other organisations received from some funding from the New South Wales Government and ARENA to run a social access solar gardens feasibility project. Uh, today in the webinar, we're going to be hearing from uh, six people. Um, uh, so to start off with, you've got myself, Nikki Eisen, uh, then I'll hand over to Jay Rudovitz. Um, she's a, the project director for the Solar Gardens Project at the Institute for Sustainable Futures. Uh, then Jara Hicks, uh, my co-founder at Community Power Agency, is going to talk about legal support um, and the legal research that was done as part of the Solar Gardens Project. Uh, Elizabeth Noble, uh, who has been the very competent project manager uh, for the whole Solar Gardens project. There's been a lot of uh, wrangling and many different moving parts. Um, Bob Hayward and the team at Repower Shoalhaven are going to give a presentation on their, um, their involvement in the Solar Gardens project and what that means for them as a community energy group moving, moving forward. Um, Tom Knockholds from Pingala was meant to be with us. Unfortunately, um, he is an apology. Uh, he is, um, his father is dying, so um, he regrets that he can't be with, here, with us today. So the agenda for the webinar uh, is that I'm gonna give a brief project overview of what we've tried to do in this Social Access Solar Gardens Feasibility Project. Um, then there's going to be uh, three presentations around the outcomes from three research streams, uh, the legal research, the customer research and the financial research. Um, then we're going to have a Q&A uh, on what come, came out of the research and then uh, we're going to move on to the teams. In the project we had different um, project teams or prototype teams. Um, we're going to give an overview of where each of those teams are at now that the project is coming to a close, the feasibility project that is, and what that means for actual solar gardens projects moving forward. And we're very excited and pleased to have Repower Shoalhaven with us. Uh, they have been a leading light of community energy and have been stars of the solar gardens. Uh, project, um, so keen to hear from them, and we'll give a little overview of what we understand Pingala's plans to be. Then we'll have a slightly longer Q&A um, around what do we need for solar gardens to work in Australia. Uh, so let's keep going. Um, project overview. Uh, so what is this project? Well, firstly, what is a solar garden? Well, a solar garden is a model that uh, we have seen uh, a lot of, particularly in the US, uh, where basically if you can't put solar on your own roof, you are able to purchase or subscribe to a share or a panels in a solar array uh, off-site. That uh, portion share is then, the electricity from that is then credited in your electricity bill, not dissimilar to the way the electricity from solar on your roof is credited on your electricity bill. So Solar Gardens is a model that emulates rooftop solar for those who aren't able to put solar on a sunny roof. Uh, why are we doing this? Well, there are at least 30% of households in Australia that are currently locked out of the benefits of solar. Um, those are people who rent, who live in apartments, who have shaded roofs, um, or simply can't afford the upfront cost of solar at this point. We 
uh, Community Power Agency and the Institute for Sustainable Futures, as well as many of the partner organisations involved in the project, have tried to look at what we can do about that. Uh, and Solar Gardens is a model internationally that has a lot of appeal uh, because it sidesteps a lot of the barriers that community, uh, that households can face, those split incentive barriers of, of landlords and tenants and, and things like that. Um, so there's been a lot of interest around solar gardens for a number of years. We decided that it was time to work out once and for all whether we could actually make them happen in Australia. Um, so the purpose of this project was to do one of two things. First, and ideally, we would, we, uh, at this project, hope to um, progress between one to four pilot social access solar garden projects, getting them ready for implementation, ensuring they were underpinned by a business model that is desirable to customers, particularly lost out, locked out energy users, viable, uh, so financially viable and feasible. However, if that wasn't possible, if the research and the work of the teams uh, found that we it wasn't viable or feasible, we wanted to identify what the specific barriers are that prevent these pilots going forward, making sure that these barriers are clearly understood and ideally identifying solutions and socialising the solutions with the key stakeholders could act, who could actually implement them. So for example, state governments. And I would say that coming to an end of this project, uh, we have achieved these objectives. Um, and we'll talk more about how we've done that uh, through the course of this webinar. Um, so the project questions was uh, that we tested. There are many questions about solar gardens and we, we couldn't answer them all, but uh, we wanted to answer as many as we could. Um, the first ones were, do customers want it? Uh, and will it increase the uptake of renewable energy? Uh, so that's around desirability. Uh, then around feasibility, is it legal? You know, are there, uh, can you legally do a solar gardens arrangement in the Australian legal and regulatory uh, system? Um, and can you make the billing systems work for electricity retailers? So one of the design features of a solar garden I mentioned was this idea that it has to have a credit on an electricity bill. That means you need to have a retailer involved. Um, and there's a question, we had a big question, could retailers actually do this bill credit arrangement? Um, so that was one of the research questions. And then finally, is it viable? Does the solar garden business model stack up for customers? That is, are they better off by participating? Um, and does it stack up for all of the other partners involved, including the, the organisation that establishes the solar farm? So who did what? Um, the project director and sort of guiding force was the Institute for Sustainable Futures, um, Community Power Agency. We undertook the project management and facilitation through the project, um, we were the engine. Uh, then we had three research teams, uh, customer research, looking at that desirability question or how to you know, approach communicating uh, solar gardens. And that was led by the Institute for Sustainable Futures with input from concentric energy. Uh, then uh, there was a financial assessment team also at ISF. And then legal advice was undertaken by Norton Rose Fulbright. Um, and they provided significant in-kind contributions. Then we had um, uh, teams around the country. We had a team in regional Queensland made up of QCOS and uh, a number of parts of Energy Queensland. Uh, we had a combined team based out of both Byron Bay and Shoalhaven that included um, the community energy groups, Three Power Shoalhaven and Quorum, and the councils, Byron Council and, um, and Three Power Council, and then there are inputs from other organisations as well. Um, there was a Blacktown team with Pingala, Blacktown City Council and Western Sydney Community Forum. They were a social welfare organisation. And then finally, we had a team in Victoria uh, in Swan Hill um, that was particularly led by Swan Hill Council. Um, and you know, there, were, there were input from various other organisations throughout the, the time. Let's move on. So I'm going to hand over to Jara now, who's going to talk about some of the findings from the legal research.
or assessment. Hi, everyone. Yeah, thanks. So I was involved um, from community power agency side, working with Norton Rose to, to do the legal review of solar gardens. I'd really like to acknowledge and thank Norton Rose Fulbright, particularly um, Martin Owen, Jackie Fletcher and John Metopoulos, who put in really a, a lot of really great work. And I think we can really confidently say that we have a very clear understanding now of the legal and the regulatory context for solar gardens in Australia, um, as well as the, an understanding of some of the basic contracts. And we've got some templates there to, to work from going forward. So the resources that have been produced here, I think are going to be really valuable for anyone wishing to explore solar gardens and, and look to implementing them. But some of the findings are also applicable more generally to community owned renewable energy. So I really encourage you to have a look at those resources. Um, the legal stream did um, two key tasks. One was an initial review of the legal considerations and the, the key questions that the teams had around um, whether solar gardens would be feasible in the Australian context. And from that came a legal report, which is publicly available and has a lot of information in there, not only about the possible legal structures that a solar garden can take, but also some of the regulatory considerations and issues um, and some of the risks to be aware of. The second key task of the legal stream was to produce a range of guides and templates to inform the implementation of a social access solar garden. These are also publicly available um, and, and are a really great resource. Okay. Um, so in terms of the key findings, uh, fantastic to say that technically there are no barriers to social access solar gardens in Australia. Um, so it is feasible from a regulatory and a legal point of view. They made, um, Norton Rose made some recommendations around how to structure a solar garden and they, they felt that um, it would be most appropriate to set up a membership vehicle, which is the vehicle that um, customers or members sign up to, whether they become shareholders or subscribers, um, they're signing up to that membership vehicle. And the membership vehicle has overall control of a special purpose vehicle, which is a development vehicle that holds, manages the development process and, and holds and mitigates a lot of the risk of a solar garden. Um, in terms of the legal structure or the legal form they recommended for that membership vehicle, they felt that um, all things considered a cooperative structure is probably the most um, fitting, the most advantageous, particularly for a community led solar garden. So some of the benefits were that, um, you know, there's unlimited membership, the, the ease and cost of establishment is quite low. Um, as are the ongoing reporting requirements, particularly if you stay as a small cooperative. But they also found that a public company has its, has its advantages and would be particularly suitable if you're operating in a more commercial context or a, a corporate-led solar garden. Um, of course, you know, um, they found that a generator license wouldn't be required if for any projects under five megawatts. Um, and similarly, the solar garden itself um, you know, wouldn't need a retail license um, as this would be held by the participating retailer. So that, that relationship with the retailer is a really, really valuable one. Um, and it is something that in terms of the billing arrangements is totally viable. And one of the key, th key concerns we had going into this project was around um, issues of third line forcing. Um, but we found that that's not an obstacle. It's not, not a barrier for solar gardens. Um, so it's not something that we need to worry about, which makes that relationship with the solar garden um, and the retailer much, much smoother. Okay. Um, Norton Rose Fulbright also did a specific legal assessment of each of the four prototype teams solar garden models. Um, and for each of them, it found that uh, Norton Rose found that there were no major red flags with what they were proposing. So this was really informative in that um, this, you know, regardless of sort of the tweaks and variations that the different teams came up with, they all looked to be feasible from a legal perspective. 
one issue that is a little bit less clear cut and a little bit um, little bit complex was whether or not um, certain models would require an Australian Financial Services Licence or an AFSL. Um, in essence, they determined that the need for an AFSL should generally be avoidable if the Solar Gardens is a co-op or a company issuing shares or memberships in itself and where they only have one PPA. So there's two triggers there that might require an AFSL. One is if there's more than one power purchase agreement um, and the other is if the, the, the membership vehicle is structured and promoted as a for-profit investment vehicle. So where they're raising, they're, they're, they're issuing shares for the explicit purpose of investing in a third party to, to generate profit. So it's a little more complex, but in most instances, they, they determined that it should be um, avoidable, that you shouldn't necessarily require an AFSL. If you do, you're able to access a third party, go through a third party to access a um, a license so you don't necessarily have to get one yourself. Uh, this is just a summary of the key legal resources that, that were created and a bit of a description of, of each of them. You can find all of these resources um, using the links in the presentation. I encourage you to go and have a look through those because they're a really great, really great resource. As I said, not just for people interested in solar gardens, but also for setting up community energy projects more generally. So there were some limitations to the research. It was outside of our scope to cover tax considerations, insurance requirements, um, and we also didn't explore not-for-profit um, legal structure options. And um, Norton Rose also kept reminding us, and it's important to, to consider that this isn't legal advice, it's an informed starting point. So um, while it's fantastic and it helps us on our way, any specific project will need to get their own specific advice. Over to Jay. Hello, um, I'm Jay Rutovitz. I'm a research director at the Institute for Sustainable Futures and I've been really delighted to um, be the project director for this project. So we did the market research at the Institute and the basic question we were addressing is, are solar gardens desirable? Uh, the work was done by Chris Reedy and Fran May, but neither of them were able to present today, which is why I'm presenting it. And we also had input from Concentric Energy, which is uh, Karen Stenner and Mark Fischel, and they are experts on behavioral economics and worked with us and with teams to try and bring the learnings really from that, that school of thought on economics into how we promoted solar gardens and the tools that we used and that was really uh, constructive. So the, the key objectives of the, uh, sorry not, the key objectives of the market research was first of all to test the solar gardens concept with our target audiences and also to inform both the design of the actual project, so at very early stages, and to inform how the concept was marketed to the key audiences. So first of all, who and where? The, the target audiences are essentially locked out consumers, so tenants, apartment dwellers, and low income households. And we also did some work with uh, we were looking at whether there was a potential for cross subsidizing between groups. So for example, would apartment dwellers be happy to pay a little bit more to enable low income households to participate? We did the research in all the locations where there are prototype teams, uh, which you've already seen. So five locations around the country. And we had two rounds of, of market testing. So the first round was really to inform project design and that was quite an extensive round. That was where we did most of the work. And we did both qualitative and quantitative. So the qualitative research, there was eight focus groups and at least one in each location and a series of interviews in Queensland and Victoria. 
the quantitative research was split testing using Facebook, and I'll explain a bit more what that actually means later on. And again, we did it in each of for each of the teams. We did five rounds in in the first set of of split testing, and that that the purpose of that first phase was really about helping the the teams work out how they would structure the projects and what was important to customers. The second round of market testing was just really about refining the messaging, and um, the teams were producing mock products so the, the type of things that they would use to register interest for example and testing what worked best so first of all what were the qualitative this is from the qualitative research the focus groups and the interviews and what were the reactions to solar gardens so overall they were pretty positive sounds fantastic this is a way to actually have solar even if you're a renter and you don't own your own roof so all very good but there were caveats. So there was anxiety about what, how will it actually work? What will it cost? How much will it save? What happens if things go wrong? And there was also anxiety about the length of the contract. So this is a, you know, potentially 10 years or more. And although that's the same if you put solo on your roof, it's a bit, it feels different because it is more abstract. So there was some concerns particularly about that, but overall it was definitely something people were interested in. But so what were the expectations? Again, this is from the qualitative research. So the first finding was that for low income households, there definitely has to be a zero upfront cost. This is not negotiable. You just there just isn't the money to put money up to invest in something and so that was very clear um, for higher income households there was interest in buying a share in the solar garden and doing that up front but what were the expectations they were actually a bit unrealistic so it was things like a, expecting a, peer, a payback period of three to five years which is shorter than what you get on rooftop solar that did change when it was explained what the payback on rooftop actually is. And certainly those expectations were that the returns should be similar to what you get if you put it on your roof. And for lease or subscription customers, there was a kind of indicative result that there would need to be savings about 20%, a reduction in your bill to make it actually worthwhile to swap over. Uh, this is just an example of what we did. So this is now the quantitative research. So this was using Facebook and really how it worked was running two different adverts for registering interest in a solar garden and seeing which got received a greater click rate. And the idea was to have, so you can, this is an example from Swan Hill and you can see the image is just the same it's just the message which is different. And there were generally we were testing an environmental versus a financial versus a message about social inclusion. Um, a relatively uh, cheap way to test different messages. We did find an incidental result, which was uh, Swan Hill actually got a very good response rate. And one of the reasons we think is that it was led by a very recognizable organization, the council, that didn't happen in other places. And we think that really improved their, their results, but we weren't specifically testing that. So there might be other factors like it's a, a more rural location. These are, this is a summary of the results from the quantitative research. So the Facebook testing and the survey. And this shows really the performance hierarchy of the messaging. So savings overall, what you're gonna save on your bills did best in terms of getting a response. Um, pretty closely followed by social inclusion and a combined message worked well. Uh, environmental, the environmental message on its own didn't perform as well with the possible exception of Byron Bay where it did do well. Uh, but all three of those did better than messages about regional benefit. So 
one of the things we did specifically want to look at was was it important for the solar garden to be located near to where the customer lived and generally the response surprisingly was it didn't matter that much although people were aware of the regional jobs and so that might become more important with an actual project but certainly from the research we did it, it didn't seem to be an important factor um, all of the messages drove traffic there was the conversion rates you know to people who actually went along to register were low but not unusual for the not profit sector and the other messages were really basic marketing messages so use direct language try and keep your messages simple don't have you know you have a lot of clutter to break through appealing to social norms was important and that was really a strong message from the behavioral econ economics uh, the images are important try and have something which catches interest and it did look like there was some regional variation in what worked but um, all of these results there there are resources available so there's re detailed reports from each of the market research phases and there's also a report on the behavioral economics perspective and these are all available from the project website so if you're interested in seeing more about it or more detail about these results then please download them and have a look so the financial research um, th this is aimed at answering that question are solar gardens viable and this was undertaken by a team at uh, the institute for sustainable futures so the key objectives are to provide teams with means to assess the viability of their projects so that they can look at different um, ways of structuring them and and answer that question is this going to work for our customers and will it actually break even so that the management organization can continue it was also to allow a more general assessment of of what are solar gardens viable in australia and the method was we developed an online financial tool so that the teams could actually test different scenarios as they were developing their project and each team had their own page which they could log up onto and set up solar gardens and then try different things different capital cost see if it would work if you were leasing you know for lease customers or purchase customers see what what inputs they would need in order to actually make it work we're also currently undertaking some generic assessments so um, we're doing four two in new south wales and one in victoria and one in queensland really with the aim of working out what are the key parameters to actually get a viable solar garden um, this is just an overview of the financial tool so the user input the key key um, assumptions so what's the capital expenditure what's the operational expenditure how is the financial structure work so is it by debt do customers pay up front or do they lease um, and the other assumptions that you would need then they they specify customer types so the total energy use importantly what feed-in tariff is payable and what share each customer owns so those are all set up in the tool and then the tool calculates the results per customer and the outcome for the solar garden itself so what's the financial position at the end of the project life the tool works the the idea of the tool was that it would work on a netting off electricity and I'm going to spend a little time explaining what that means and it does actually treat electricity that is generated from your share when you are using it differently from what's generated that is in excess to what you use some of the teams decided that they didn't want to structure their their solar garden like that so essentially all the electricity was exported um, but the tool certainly has that um, capability yes so what does it actually mean if you're saying that you're netting off electricity 
So this is a, a 24 hour profile here of, of um, a residential use. That's the overall dotted line there. And then this is the solar profile of what's being generated from your share. So this part at, th at this time of the day from, for this particular example, from eight in the morning, hmm, that's a little bit over ambitious, but uh, to five at night, all of your electricity is actually being generated from your solar. And all this bit, this, sh this shaded bit here would be netted off electricity. The bit on the top is where the solar is actually generating more than what you're using and that's excess. And that's treated as if it was exported, so similar to having solar on your roof. Now the, the dotted line, so that's your gross usage, that's actually how you, the basis for the network charges, the market fees and the environmental levies. Now we'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute, about what, how the actual bill credit is calculated. And then this part is just normal electricity tariff, so anything where, which is excess of the solar. So how's the bill credit actually calculated? This is the netted off. This is for the electricity that's netted off. Only the energy part is actually netted off. So your network fees, your market costs are entirely unchanged. Uh, the energy rate is netted off the retailer margin, but there is actually a charge which is applied within the tool per kilowatt of netted off electricity. Uh, to account for the, the billing costs and so forth. And the tool is set, this is netted off on a time of use basis. So it's really about what is being generated from your share when you're using it. So within the tool, the user selects your network tariffs, your retailer tariffs, and your consumption and generation profiles. So within the tool, there are 38 different networks and retail tariffs across the four areas. It is rather a complex area. And about just over 40 consumption and generation profiles. So the user, those are in the tool, the user selects them for their project. And there's a lot of complexity in tariff combinations, but that all happens behind the scenes, really. So this, this slide is just looking at what the range of input assumptions between the teams and also now for our generic um, assessments and a lot of information here, I won't go through it all. So just some key ones. If we look at these, these first about the, the costs, so the annual maintenance and overheads per kilowatt, big range from the lowest to the highest in the teams. And this is just important to bear in mind when we look at the actual results for the different teams. The cost per kilowatt as well, almost a, you know, a doubling between what different teams used. And likewise, the subsidy from nothing to nearly 50%. Um, on our generic assessments, we've looked at two things. We've tried to, to see what's a, a re reasonably achievable, and those are kind of mid-range for most things. And then we worked out, well, what subsidy do you need to actually make this viable? So that's really how we're approaching the generic assessments is to see what parameters are needed. Oh, sorry. Uh, the other thing just to notice there is that the feed-in tariff on the exported electricity the teams use a range from zero to 16. We've gone pretty much in the middle, but this is an important element. So particularly if you're, if the shares are quite large, so a lot of it is being exported, what the feed-in tariff is for those export is really important. So these are the customer outcomes. Um, for upfront for purchases, first of all, they're not, these are from the teams. And, and I should say that these, for the teams, these are iterative, so they are still developing them. This was the point that they were making, I think this was at the final workshop. 
um, but I'm sure those will still change. And these on the right are from our generic assessments. So the red line is what the payback you would expect from rooftop solar, so about five years. And you can see that none of the team assessments were getting to that. And our generic one, so this is just what is exactly at you know, cost, doesn't come anywhere near it. With the 50% subsidy, that's, that's really getting to a similar range. It varied a little bit around the states. This is an average of the, the four generic assessments results. So we are really looking at around 50% subsidy to get, in, to get to a viable solar garden. This is for lease purchases, the same. And this is so the the um, the this is the percentage saving on the bill. So the higher up you go, the better. And again, really, we're looking at a fifty percent subsidy to get to the the indicative results that people were saying were worthwhile changing. The other thing that came out for lease customers was you need to do a reasonably big share in order, you know, like three kilowatts we're looking at to actually start getting towards the percentage savings that are needed. And what's driving the outcomes? Uh, clearly capital, you know, cost and both capital and operational is really important and subsidy. So those, you know, if you reduce your cost by half, that's similar to having a 50% subsidy. But at what we think a mid-range, we it's really not going to work without a subsidy. Uh, I might go skip that. This is just really the only important thing from this slide is what what sort of subsidies are we talking about per household? So the least, which really is the low-income consumers, probably. Um, we're looking at about just under 4,000. Well, this isn't out of the ballpark and of what's being proposed in Victoria and New South Wales. Um, New South Wales has announced free PV installations for low income consumers up to two and a half kilowatts. This is quite similar. So the conclusions from the financial research were really size and cost matters. It was, very difficult with the smaller projects to actually end up with a viable solar garden, although you get advantages, of course, that you can try something, but the operational cost is spread over a much smaller amount of customers. It does need a subsidy to get a sufficiently good return. Um, it can work for all locked out consumers, uh, but we did find it was generally not suitable for business customers. The returns just weren't high enough. Uh, better for the solar garden if the, all the output goes to the customers rather than keeping a share and leasing definitely the only option for low income consumers. And I think we are at the question stage. You're mute, Nikki. Sorry. Uh, yes, yeah, so and we're running a little bit long. So just time for a couple of questions. Marie, Mark, or Tricia, do you have any questions? If you want to put it in the Q and A um, function in in um, Zoom. Nothing is particularly coming through. Um, so we might move on, but um, if you have any questions, put them either in the chat or the Q&A and um, we will endeavour to answer them. Um, so we're going to move on now to uh, hear a little bit of an overview of where all the teams are at from Elizabeth and then hear um, uh, specifically from the Repower Shoalhaven team. So over to you, Elizabeth. Thanks, Nikki. Uh, yeah, I'm Elizabeth Noble. I'm the project manager for the Social Access Solar Gardens project. And yeah, it's been a really interesting um, project to be part of. And as you can see, there's been a lot of work that's been done. Um, before we go on to hear from Shoalhaven, I thought it would be good just to quickly summarise kind of where all the teams have, have gotten to um, by looking at the statement of intent. So this was one of the key project outcomes. Um, 
for the project. And essentially it's just a letter that each partner organisation provided um, to show whether or not they plan to implement their, their solar garden pilot. So if they decided, yes, they were going to proceed, then we did request that they set out the conditions under which they would be able to proceed. If they chose that, no, they weren't able to proceed at this point, we asked them to identify any of the barriers or reasons why um, they can't move forward at this stage. So as you can see, most of the partners have actually chosen to proceed, which is fantastic. Um, there's only Blacktown City Council and Energy Queensland who have decided not to move forward with their pilot at this stage in time. However, I think it's worth noting that both of them have also decided to continue working on, on solar gardens and Energy Queensland have committed to revisit the concept in about 12 months when they're going to have some more organisational capacity to, um, to explore the concept. And Blacktown City Council, whilst they're not proceeding, they have said that even when they can secure a site, they would like to pilot a solar garden. So uh, it's been, you know, it's a really positive outcome for the project. Um, for the organisations that have chosen to proceed, they have outlined lots of different conditions. Um, however, there were several that were common across all of the different partners. Um, so you can see in this slide that overwhelmingly, um, securing funding was a key condition for pretty much every organisation that decided to proceed. So um, most of them also identified that this was essential to enable lower income households to be able to participate in solar gardens. Um, you can also see that having continued partnerships was also a key condition for many of the organisations. Um, so having not only strong and ongoing partnerships within the project teams, but also with a retailer, of course. Um, other issues that were recurring amongst the statement of intent was uh, doing some further market testing and also resolving site issues and grid connection issues. Uh, so that was, that was common to quite a few of the, the different teams who haven't been able to resolve all of the issues around their site at this stage. Um, there was also a couple of community energy organisations and a couple of councils who also um, stated that it was really important for them to have a funded staff member to be able to undertake development work for them to be able to progress their solar garden pilot. Uh, organisational buy-in was also something that popped up for um, a couple of the councils, I guess the larger kind of organisations as well as Energy Queensland. Um, so that's just a, a really brief overview of some of the, the key issues that need to be resolved. But I think it's it's just worth repeating, you know, the the need for funding is obvious and pretty much every organisation has said that, you know, for this to, to really happen, they need external support. So uh, we're going to hand over to Bob Hayward uh, from Repower Shoalhaven, who's been leading the team there, uh, to tell us where what your plans are. And you're muted at the moment, Bob. I can unmute you. There you go. Okay, thank you. Can you hear me? Okay. Just a, a, a quick overview via a few slides. Um, we. We came at this initially um, having already embarked on wanting to develop a solar farm garden and, and saw this as an opportunity to develop a, a different perspective on, on the proposal. And, and it's been extremely useful for us, I must say, the whole study, um, mainly because it kept us focused. <laughs> um, so we had a... Um, a, a motto which is to drive energy from the Shoalhaven for the Shoalhaven and that would be our marketing pitch into the um, region when we go to seek funding. Um, all the other matters were similar to the concept for the whole scheme. If you can do the next size, slide please Elizabeth. Thank you. So we have a site 
identified, 12 hectares. We don't need all of that site. It's a disused um, waste site in North Narra, very adjacent to the distribution network and to the um, urban area. Um, it's cleared, available, and has a sealed road access. It is currently under the control of council. It is owned by Crown Lands, and we are working through with council to get access to that site. It is subject to a native title claim under the federal law, but is not compliant with the requirements for a native title claim, and we're currently working through having it excluded from that claim. Next slide, please. Okay, we have the support of council who have unanimously committed for the approvals for the solar garden. And uh, we have discussed arrangements with them. We would actively in, enter into a long-term lease at a minimum cost. Um, and uh, we've got those in principle agreements with council pending the native title issue. It is a permissible use of the site um, EPA have agreed in principle to the use of the site as a, an ex-waste site. Uh, Endeavour Energy have given an indication of approval for connection. Our principal challenge now is to raise the funding to get that confirmed and locked in. Um, next slide, please. So the project would be four megawatts of uh, ground mounted, non-tracking solar panels. The economics say that tracking is a better option, but the financial raising is a limit to meeting the best economic outcome. The pre-construction costs we have estimated at $178,000, um, and uh, of which 75,000 is for the initial engineering and endeavors uh, estimated cost of approval to connect. And that is a huge impediment because that money is entirely at risk if the project does not proceed. We've estimated the capital cost at 4.8 million um, and we're reasonably confident of that and the operational costs are around $65,000 a year. So based on that, our intent is to Based on all of the research we have, we need to get to the point where we have a defined project which has approvals. It's only at that point that we can then actively seek grant monies and investment monies from the private and public sector. So we're determined to raise the funding to commit and conclude that planning phase. Um, and, uh, and all the rest will, will, will fall into place from there. So as Elizabeth said in her summary, in the end, it comes down to the funding. If we can raise the funding for the planning, then we have a scheme that we can take um, and raise the capital for. And I'm, you know, I'm reasonably confident we can do that if we can get past this first phase. That's it. Thanks, Bob. Um, Elizabeth, do you just want to run through Pingala's intent? Uh, yeah, yeah. So, uh, unfortunately, Pingala can't be with us tonight, um, but I did speak with Tom earlier, and he was really clear about um, Pingala's enthusiasm for developing solar gardens. So, this is something that they are going to do, they're determined, um, they're ready, and Really, the only thing that is holding them back at this stage is finding some funding to support their first pilot project. So, um, yeah, they're, they're, they've secured a site, they're ready to go. They really just need the, the financials to stack up for them um, and particularly get a, a funded position to enable their work. Um, and I might jump in there and say there's been a lot of work. So developing a solar gardens, as you probably will be aware by now, um, has a high degree, degree of complexity. So there's the technical side that Bob particularly focused on and the building of the solar farm. Um, and then 
uh, there's the customer engagement and the community engagement piece um, that was really the emphasis of the market research. Um, and then there's the business model. How do all the players fit together? What are their roles? What are the relationships? And, um, and how does it all work in, in a functioning unit? And a lot of this project has gone into designing that business model. Um, uh, and different uh, teams have developed slightly different variations of that business model that has then come through in the different assumptions around the finances and things like that. Some of those finances are, are um, you know, cost of solar, but some of them are around, you know, the cost of the legal setup and all of those kinds of things. Um, the, the quite exciting thing from a business model perspective is there are different ways to make this work. Um, some key things coming out of the legal research is that a, a cooperative might be co a core central feature, but the relationship and the financial flows, particularly between that member cooperative and the retailer has been thought out in some detail. Um, and so you know, that's what a number of the community energy groups particularly have done some work around. And so, uh, yeah, I just wanted to add that extra bit in. So to come to our next steps, I think to summarise, uh, we do have pilot projects that are keen to proceed. Uh, they are underpinned by business models that are both desirable in many cases to people wanting to participate in solar gardens and feasible, so they are legal and the billing arrangements can be done. Are they viable? They are marginal. So, you know, that was always the biggest concern and really because our network costs are so high in Australia, it's not surprising, I think, to probably many industry actors to find out that this in front of the metre um, solar garden model is um, has some questions around viability. That said, if you look at the level of subsidy and support that has gone into rooftop solar, both historically in terms of bid-in tariffs and rebates, and most recently uh, in New South Wales and Victoria, um, Jay mentioned the New South Wales program to provide free solar to, I think, um, 15,000 low-income households. Uh, and in Victoria, they have got a program to put solar on the roofs of 650,000 homes and additional 50,000 renters. If we could open up and expand both of those programs to support uh, participants in solar gardens, um, we would be able to see the solar gardens business model uh, model get up and operating. So I think it's very much a feasible or viable proposition from a, um, a political perspective. So our next steps from the project, uh, we want to see these pro pilot projects get up and running. Um, there are some grant funding avenues that groups are exploring and the project team is supporting those groups to pursue. Uh, then there will be an advocacy piece, um, particularly focusing to start off with on the New South Wales and Victorian governments because of their existing programs supporting locked out energy users. Um, and then finally, one of the um, recommendations from Norton Road Fulbright was this idea of a solar gardens aggregation cooperative, which would be a co-op of co-ops to manage the administration and the relationship with the retailer. We think this idea has some merit because it would enable more communities to be able to deliver solar gardens without having to navigate the full complexity and set up all of the legal arrangements themselves. Um, so those are our three proposed next steps. Um, we're really excited and pleased with this project. It's been a lot of hard work by a lot of people involved, um, but we think we can say for certain solar gardens can happen in Australia if we have the will, particularly the political will, to make them happen. So with that point, um, are there any questions that people might have or comments for that matter? I realise there's a T missing from the comments. Uh -huh. right. um, there's a couple of questions on the Q&A that have come through. So oh, should we start? Excellent. Yes, that's great. Retail costs, so from Marie, retail costs vary dramatically depending on particular offer in Victoria State Government has created default offer that could be cheaper. Could Solar Gardens partner with an offer like this to reduce costs to consumers? Jay, do you want to have mm. a go at that? 
Yes, that's absolutely right that retail costs vary dramatically. And of course, as with rooftop solar, if you are getting the benefit of a solar, gar um, a solar garden, so you're mimicking rooftop solar, there is this funny effect, of course, that the more you're paying for your electricity, the quicker the solar garden will pay back, just like rooftop solar will pay back quickly, more quickly if you're paying more for your electricity. So it's not an obvious partnership, but certainly any state government that is looking to reduce costs for consumers, that's absolutely a reason for them to put money to subsidize people's share of a solar garden because it does two things it reduces cost and it also it increases participation and it increases participation in the energy transition which is a really important factor both for it to be equitable for different consumers but also just in increasing people's buy-in to what we need to do so it's not a direct and obvious partnership but certainly there's plenty of reasons why state governments might be interested in participating Great. Um, so the next question, uh, how are the retailers that have begun um, specifically for renewable energy going, are they supportive of solar gardens? Um, maybe I'll jump in on that one and say yes. Uh, so PowerShop, which has a, a, a reputation for being a strongly renewable based organisation, uh, retailer has been one of the key participants in this. Um, and they are very supportive of solar gardens. You saw that they have a statement of intent to continue with solar gardens. Um, Enova, I didn't mention, was uh, the community-owned retailer. Uh, it was also a project participant. They have a behind-the-meter solar garden model rather than in front of the meter model. Um, and we've done a summary, uh, sort of a case study on them, and th so they are very supportive. Um, we know that um, Repower Shoalhaven has a partnership with Energy Locals, also another disruptive and renewable-based um, retailer, and they're very interested in solar gardens. So certainly that the newer retailers that have more software-based and sophisticated billing systems, uh, systems are going to be actually more e easier more easily able to adopt the solar garden model we anticipate um, but also that they have the appetite um, because of their commitment to renewable energy and should i go in with the next one so yeah. this is from trisha a lot of small regional communities have a higher proportion of low-income population and renters and the question was whether those small play the that was a comment really it sounds like those small places wouldn't be able to consider a solar garden on their own I don't think that's the case in fact the key question is whether there's a subsidy so a subsidy is actually needed to make it work for people who are upfront purchases and for lease purchases but from the solar garden organizational point of view you could have a hundred percent lease purchases providing there is that upfront subsidy from um well either a donor or a state government so there is no reason why you couldn't set up a solar garden for a small community or to service a small community that was a hundred percent social access so it was a hundred percent low income consumers but if you are organization viable yeah, and then I think the question from an organisational perspective, it really depends on the level of sophistication of the community energy group that you have. Certainly Repower Shoalhaven in um, regional New South Wales um, and uh, some of the community groups uh, in the Northern Rivers, in central Victoria are, are you know, pretty sophisticated outfits. So I think it really depends on the capability of the organisation uh, available in that particular town. Uh, councils also could play a really leading role here. Um, and so it, um, it depends um, on that. And then hopefully as we see um, this market or this model develop, we'll see more and more organisations offering partnership options that mean that we can reach even further. And I, I'd just like to add to that, that I think that's particularly where the aggregation model would come into play. So if we do have a, a kind of co-op of co-ops that 
that really allows smaller communities or smaller councils to almost um, subscribe to a portion off the shelf or have a, a satellite organization which becomes a member of that. Hopefully this will really reduce the organizational burden quite significantly and we could see a lot more of those very small communities participate. So the question from Mark, and I think we might take this as the last question since we're at 7.03. Uh, what prices are the retailers willing to offer the solar garden developer as an offtake? Uh, and I think the, the quick answer to that is it depends on the retailer. Um, we had a couple of different retailers involved and they were very different uh, ends of the spectrum. One of the advocacy opportunities we've identified is the idea of making, um, particularly in Victoria, where there's a mandated feed-in tariff, um, making solar garden portion shares um, eligible for that feed-in tariff. So if it's going to act like it's three kilowatts on your roof, you should be able to access the benefits of that feed-in tariff. Um, so certainly some of the conversations that we've been having with retailers is around that mandated or recommended feed-in tariff uh, a level for the, the offtake. But I wouldn't put words in any retailer's mouths to commit them to say they've signed on the dotted line for that. You know, there's still a way to go to get the first pilot projects up. And I, I'd just like to add to that, that that's actually part of the what we need from state governments is that we really do need to have it that the, the portions that are owned by customers are treated as residential small systems so that feed-in tariffs that are available to rooftop solar are available to that portion and that's part of the reason why we found it was better and I, I think politically better for all of the offtake to go to customers because while it's very easy to argue or reasonable to argue that while you're mimicking rooftop solar for locked out consumers that residential feed-in tariff should be available that really doesn't apply to the organization which is you know the residual would just be selling into the market Okay, uh, I think we're going to wrap it up there. I want to thank uh, all of our panellists, Bob Haywood and the team at um, Repower Shoal Haven, Jay Rudovitz, Elizabeth Noble, Jarrah Hicks, um, and our participants, and all those people who are going to watch online. Um, thank you, everyone. Uh, here are some links for where you can find out more information. Uh, please um, go forth and solar garden. Uh, <laughs> and get in touch if you would like to get more involved or find out more. Thanks. Bye.